Hi, I'm Corinne Haining Laverty, author of North America's Galapagos, the Historic Channel Islands Biological Survey. I'm here with Santa Catalina Island in the background to share with you a story about a series of unprecedented expeditions mounted in 1939 to study California's eight Channel Islands, of which Catalina is one. Before delving into this, however, I invite you to join me in acknowledging the island's first inhabitants, the island Chumash and island Tongva peoples, and to extend to them our respect and gratitude for their conservation and stewardship of these magnificent landscapes. This story is about a group of people who came together in the late 1930s under the aegis of the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. Their mission, to piece together the human history and biological evolution of California's eight channel islands. But importantly, it's also about the islands themselves, the plants and animals that make them unique, and the role they have played in our better understanding of how and when North America was first populated. The Channel Islands Biological Survey was not the first survey ever mounted to study these islands, nor was it the last. However, its eight island multidisciplinary scope set it apart from any that had come before, and it has never been replicated. Not only that, but the story has never been told until now. San Clemente, Santa Catalina, Santa Barbara, San Nicolas, Ana Capa, Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa, and San Miguel Islands lie within the Southern California Bight like giant paint splatters on a Google Earth-sized Jackson Pollock canvas. They vary considerably. They range from Point Conception to San Diego. Some are as small as one square mile, the largest is 96 square miles. The closest to shore is just 11 miles away, but the furthest lies 61 miles out at sea. Each supports unique ecosystems. Some have no fresh water on them, however, and everything on them relies on rainwater or fog for its freshwater sustenance. Today, these islands are used as military bases, tourist destinations, and five of them compose Channel Islands National Park. Millions of years ago, the rocks that would become the Channel Islands lay submerged on the seafloor near present-day San Diego as part of the North American plate. Through complicated geologic activity and plate tectonics, some of the rocks were dragged as much as 150 miles northward and rotated as much as 180 degrees clockwise. Two million years ago, they began rising out of the ocean in roughly the current configuration that we see them today. Now, what is important about this geological discussion is I want you to remember that these islands were never attached to any terra firma that could have colonated them with plants or animals. That means everything living on them had to get out there somehow, either by being blown on the wind, flying, swimming across the channel, being brought by humans, or rafting on a log and reaching the shores that way. Regardless of how they got there, once there, they had to adapt to their island environments and evolve. Given their complicated past, you might well imagine that these islands are wild, harsh, thrilling, and spoiled. Spoiled in terms of humankind's careless use of them through the introduction of exotic species such as horses, cattle, goat, sheep, rats, rabbits, cats, agricultural crops, and incidentally introduced plants as well. Despite their uses, however, they have resisted domestication, even though we've attempted to use them as ranch lands, big game hunting parks, recreational venues, movie sets, and even live ship to shore military firing ranges. Still, 150 plants and animals either currently make or have made their homes on these islands and nowhere else on the planet hence their nickname, North America's Galapagos. Of the approximately 800 plants living on the Channel Islands, 600 of those are native, and of these, roughly 70 are Channel Islands endemics, meaning they live only on one or more of the Channel Islands and nowhere else. The Santa Rosa Torrey Pine is found only within two groves on Santa Rosa Island and is an example of a Channel Islands endemic plant. Some of the unique animals you might find on the islands include the island scrub jay, which is the island's only endemic bird species, and it lives only on Santa Cruz Island. Other unique animals include subspecies of birds, 
a shrew, some certain kinds of mice, um, a spotted skunk, reptiles, and amphibians. The Channel Islands pygmy mammoth, which was once the smallest mammoth in North America, is an example of a Channel Islands endemic that is now extinct. Perhaps the best known and most beloved of all the Channel Islands animals is the island fox. Weighing no more than six and a half pounds, this adorable creature evolved from the much larger mainland gray fox and is today the top terrestrial predator on the Channel Islands. It also went nearly extinct on all six islands that it inhabits as recently as 1999. Now the causes of this near extinction are very complicated, but are linked to DDT poisoning and ranching activities. Luckily for the fox and us, conservation efforts succeeded in saving this animal from going extinct on all six islands that it inhabits, and today it is being monitored and managed. Now, the saga of the Channel Islands fox is an important reminder to us of the fragility of island ecosystems. Islands evolved in isolation, and they do best when we do not bring non-native plants and animals to their shores. It wasn't long ago that most of us were taught that people first came to the Americas on foot by crossing over the Bering Land Bridge and settling into an area of the United States that is now known as Clovis, New Mexico. And while that did happen, scientists today believe that people actually first came to the United States via a Pacific Coastal Migratory Route, and they did so much earlier than previously believed. Support for the Pacific Coastal Migration Model comes in no small part from archaeological investigations made on the Channel Islands over the last 40 to 50 years. For instance, there are a multitude of sites on these islands that date to 9,000 years of age or older. And these might actually not be the oldest or first inhabited sites that ever occurred on the islands. This is because before sea level rise at the end of the last ice age, the islands were much larger. In fact, the four northern islands were once one island named Santa Rosé, and that island's landmass was 76% larger than the current landmass of these four islands. That means that the earliest, longest inhabited coastal sites may well be underwater. A very important site was also found on the most northern of the islands, San Miguel. This is a site called Daisy Cave, and it is a rock shelter shell midden site that has offered scientists evidence that people have been on that island for at least 12,000 years. That is the oldest shell midden ever found in North America. Likewise, on neighboring Santa Rosa Island, a human remains were found in the 1950s in Arlington Canyon and these remains were dubbed Arlington Man. Now, while Arlington Man was considered old at the time of the discovery, it wasn't until modern radiocarbon dating techniques could be applied in 1999 that Arlington Man's true antiquity could be appreciated. Arlington Man lived more than 13,000 years ago, making those remains the oldest known in North America. So taken all together, scientists today believe that people came to North America via a Pacific coastal migratory route, and that they did so between 14 and 20,000 years ago. So you can see there are many interesting things on these islands, but no one had ever attempted a survey such as the Channel Islands Biological Survey. Credit for that goes to Donald C. Meadows, who, when he proposed the idea, was a 41-year-old Long Beach, California high school biology teacher, a father, and husband and a lepidopterist with a personal collection of 20,000 butterfly. He was a very ambitious man and he wanted to do something that had never been done before, survey all the butterflies and moths on the Channel Islands. But he realized that this was a daunting undertaking. So he went to John Adams Comstock, the director of science at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. And Comstock saw merit in Meadows' idea but he saw it as something much bigger. He wanted all of the scientists involved. So he wanted the ornithologists, the mammologists, the geologists, the paleontologists, the archeologists, the invertebrate zoologists, and the botanists to go out on these islands. He thought that this survey would take a period of five years of field work, during which time the scientists would make specimen collections, bring them back to the laboratory where they would analyze them. Then he expected them to write peer-reviewed scholarly articles Following that, he wanted them to publish for the popular press and then to develop museum displays. So together with Meadows, 
they put together a proposal that they presented to the museum's governing board. And on Christmas Eve 1938, it was approved. But this is rather remarkable when you consider the times, because the United States was still suffering the effects of the Great Depression. And Los Angeles was besieged by police racketeering and political corruption, not to mention the fact that the museum was under severe budgetary constraints. Well, to ensure this survey's approval, Comstock included one very shrewd provision. He promised the museum's board that this ambitious undertaking would cost them absolutely nothing over and above staff salaries of the scientists involved. That meant that citizen scientists like Don Meadows could participate, but they would not get paid. It also meant that the scientists had to bring all of their own food, purchase it, bring all of their own camping gear, and hire their own camp cook. They also had to find free transportation to and from the islands for themselves and their considerable gear. Well, to solve this big obstacle, John Adams Comstock developed relationships with California Fish and Game, who put their cruisers at the disposal of the survey. He also developed a relationship with Captain Alan Hancock, a millionaire gentleman scientist with a beautifully outfitted modern research vessel who agreed to participate. And these relationships served the museum well over the next several years. So the first expedition of the Channel Islands Biological Survey was launched in February 1939, and Arthur Woodward was on board. He went to a total of five islands during the survey years and was the museum's archaeologist and historian. He is credited for bringing a new level of scientific rigor to archaeological investigations on the Channel Islands and became a vocal advocate of the need to curtail pot hunting activities where private citizens were profiting by the desecration of Native American sites. He also collected, and some of the items he collected were soft goods that typically deteriorate in mainland sites. But on the islands, in some locations, salt spray permeates the site preserving these soft materials. So he was able to find pieces of grass skirt, basketry, mission woven cloth, otter fur, and pieces of wooden boats, including a boat prow that still had a piece of rope attached to it. He also photo documented his journey across San Nicolas Island, where he retraced the footsteps of the sea captain who brought the lone woman of San Nicolas Island to Santa Barbara in 1853, which was 18 years after mission fathers had removed her people, leaving her and possibly her son to live there alone for all that time. Now, if that sounds familiar to you, you might recall Scott O'Dell's award-winning young adult novel, Islands of the Blue Dolphins, which was a fictionalized account of her true story. Jack von Bloker Jr. was the museum's mammalogist and bat expert, and he visited all eight islands while on the survey. He was compulsive, driven, and also a really good field man. He noticed right away that the islands were suffering because of the non-native animals and plants that were on them. And he was particularly concerned about Anacapa and Santa Barbara Islands, which are historically predator-free. They had never had any foxes living on them. And thus, seabirds relied on these environments to nest and fledge their young. They are ground-nesting birds, and you can understand how they would be very vulnerable to predation. So he initiated a letter-writing campaign to the government agency that became the National Park Service, urging eradication of rats, rabbits, and cats from these islands. And today, under the protection of the National Park Service, Santa Barbara and Anacapa Islands are predator-free and the seabird populations are coming back to use these islands and we're seeing them grow in number. Jack von Blocher also published several articles about the finds that were made on the Channel Islands, including about the first shrew ever found on the Channel Islands, as well as some subspecies of white-footed mice that he discovered on Anacapa and Santa Rosa Islands. His seminal work, The Land Mammals of the Southern California Islands, are still in use today. Now, in December 1941, the scientists were on Santa Rosa Island and found themselves stranded because the United States had entered into World War II. Ship traffic had been halted, the ports were closed, the west coast was blocked out, and they were prohibited from using their radio telephones to contact the mainland. But leave it to John Adams Comstock to somehow commandeer a cattle boat to go to Santa Rosa Island and bring back all of the researchers safe and sound one day later than their itinerary originally planned. 
However, this had to have been a bittersweet channel crossing because it marked the end of the Channel Islands Biological Survey, cut short by war more than two years early. Even so, the survey accomplished its goals. All eight islands were visited by a full contingent of scientific disciplines, including 33 participants, museum researchers, teenagers, citizen scientists, immigrants, and women, including the first two trained female archaeologists ever to work on the Channel Islands. Now, in closing, I'd like to quote from a letter that John Adams Comstock wrote to Jack von Blucher while he was still stationed at Lowry Air Force Base in Colorado. He wrote, in November 1945, barely two months after the war ended, quote, personally, I wish we had all the old gang back on the job and could take up the Channel Islands survey where we left off. There is still much to do, unquote. Comstock probably could not have imagined the flood of scientific investigations going on on these Channel Islands today, but I'm sure that he and all of the participants would be proud of the role they played in ensuring that the scientific process continues long after individual efforts cease. Thank you.